Welcome. Today we are going to talk about something that connotes potential, opportunity, transformation. It's also wrapped in uh, controversy and uh, a few misconceptions. And that is the Colombo Port City. Uh, we have with us a Commission member and the Acting Director General of the Colombo Port City Economic Commission, uh, Mr. Salia Vikramasurya. Thanks for joining us, Salia. It's good to be on the show, Devan. Thank you. Uh, to start things off, you know, the, the economy is in a challenging footing. We have a currency crisis. Uh, we have uh, debts we need to pay off. And uh, we're virtually locked out of capital markets, international capital markets. Uh, we're looking for bilateral bailouts. And there's a prospect of painful debt restructuring hanging over us or maybe a less painful IMF uh, deal. So FDI is urgently needed and everyone is uh, looking at you know where this is going to come from. So I guess that's where the Colombo Port City comes in. Um, uh, let's leave aside some of the controversies and misconceptions about the project. But I think we all realize that there is potential to become a financial hub. Uh, international uh, economic center. Hopefully that will feed into the rest of the economy. Uh, but my first question to you, Sali, is how do you read the economic challenges before us? And, and in turn, what does that mean to the Commission you know, in trying to attract investments? The one you outlined the challenges we faced pretty well. In the context of attracting investment into the port city, the Commission takes a slightly longer view in that these are challenges, these are imminent challenges and uh, solutions will have to be found. And those solutions are not within the purview of the Commission. So the Commission sets about meeting its objectives, looking at a slightly longer game and uh, attracting foreign direct investment is one of the fundamental objects of the Commission. The thing about FDI is, is that it's spread out over a period of time. So just because we sign up a particular project doesn't mean that the money for that project comes in all at once. So the Commission is setting the groundwork to be still attractive over the medium to long term for investors. Wouldn't it matter to, to settle you know, some of our long-standing macroeconomic problems? So, that's on one side, then we have inconsistent policy. Uh, we have retrospective super gain taxes coming in, which kind of throws off uh, any investor import controls. So can we then seriously look at trying to attract serious investors into the port city? Uh, when we have so many issues unresolved. It would be nice not to have those issues. And you're right, it's, dip, it's impossible to divorce the Port City project from Sri Lanka's macroeconomic challenges. They are part of country risk, perception and reality, and it's difficult to circumvent them head on. But what the Commission has uh, as an advantage to offer investors is the ability to craft regulations that are independent of the broader regulations pertaining to the sector in the country and make certain sectors, certain specific projects attractive from an international point of view. And that's where the Commission is focusing. Before we come to these regulations that uh, the Commission is uh, contempla contemplating, can you just briefly give us, you know, if you can lay out the mandate, the Commission's mandate, and you know, what are the objectives? What are you trying to achieve? Thank you. It's a good question. I have to split it up into phases because the project is a 25 year life cycle project and the Commission's mandate as given in the Act uh, primarily is to attract foreign direct investment into the initial stages of this project. Now that there are two possibilities there. One is physical infrastructure development, which is where the project has been a planned city, it's a master planned city with development control regulations. And the other one is an, an a business enabler service providers, 
um, that there is the act also allows for investment to be made under port city law but physically located outside of the port city for five years so there are a variety of other financial services and other aspects service aspects if you like that can start immediately and uh, you know under the concept of virtual port city that can happen without too much delay uh, so could you just briefly explain tell us the difference between the the, the regulator and the, the administrative body uh, i mean uh, the china harbor and uh, the port city is is a company right so uh, what's the relationship between the commission and the the, the main investor the the main investor the the actual master developer the people who invested their money in reclaiming the land is the Czech port city company they are a subsidiary of another chinese soe large the commission is the owner of the land which was reclaimed and added to sri lanka sovereign territory by the investment of the project company so the two stakeholders are one is the one is an investor the other one is uh, if you like uh, a, a land owner and rule setter regulations draft a governance part one is the investor they are involved in the marketing and uh, commercialization or the monetization of their investment and the other is responsible for attracting investment in jointly and setting the rules that govern the project so Czech Port City, they they've already invested 1.4 billion in the land. Something like that. One billion on three 60-story buildings. Uh, so when you say the commission is the de facto land over, a land owner, does that also include the 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 the, the parcel that was leased to China for 99 years? Now there, the the government through the commission has freehold title to the entire property. government has given by means as a means of uh, obtaining a return on investment the right to lease on or build on in other words commercialize or approximately 40% of the reclaimed land that's in different plots each plot has been themed so the project company shall we call it that check port city has essentially two choices they have the rights 99 year lease of these plots of land 40% approximately of the whole they can either sell the right to lease on to another party and recover cash that's a short term view or they could invest further in developing on that plot or those plots and recover their investment over a longer period of time and possibly use some financial leverage but the entire area will be regulated by the commission correct can you tell us what what are your short term objectives i think uh, since uh, the commission was appointed you know what are the first three steps that you're trying to take the first step the one is to attract investment into this property now to do that you've got to make the property this project competitive and we are looking at global investment and therefore it has to be globally competitive so the commission is spending a little time doing some benchmarking and understanding of what the challenges are in other jurisdictions what can we do to overcome those challenges in the port city and how the port city can actually be more attractive in terms of its policies and regulations than other competitive centers now these are this is all money that's out there so we have to either bring it from somewhere else into sri lanka or we have to have a green field opportunity open up in sri lanka that uh, it draws brand new money both of those are challenging in the current economic condition not just sri lanka but globally so we we have to pay a little attention to what we are going to create as a product to pull quality investment in so we are really looking at anchor investors starting off and then using their leverage and their network and their reputation their credibility to further penetrate the market so, so you're looking at benchmarks 
for a regulatory authority for a special economic zone yeah. or an international financial hub uh, w- what are the benchmarks are you looking at right now? that's a good question thank you different areas require different benchmarks if you're looking at the international financial center then we are looking at uh, the, the classic comparators singapore and dubai if you're looking at the the gaming and the leisure sector then there are other comparators there are other other areas other zones that specialize in good regulations and big attraction into in those sectors then there there's a school there's a hospital there's a convention center there are all sorts of things that really need to be benchmarked against different competitors there is no one uh, project in, in the world i believe that we can take holistically and benchmark against sports city could you give us some timelines as well i think earlier this year it was in the news you know the government said that the commission will have strict targets and that they'll be monitored it'll all be performance based I'm not i can't remember if there was a number thrown out but you know maybe like first few years couple of years there'll be so many billion dollars worth of fdi coming in so do you have targets to achieve and or something like that yeah i can't say that we do if there were any targets like that they were not created by the commission there may be expectations uh, as opposed to targets the commission has been uh, given the mandate to do the right job first time that's quite important to do uh, rather than uh, go backwards and forwards and experiment too much certain things need to be done right the first time and our initial regulatory framework that covers the fundamentals of doing business needs to be done correctly now there is also another qualifier here the seven, there are 74 plots in total in the in the project defined plots of which uh, the commission has actually only received 31 thus far now 31 is the is the completed technically certified uh, areas of development that we have to market some of them are marketed by the project company and it's their lease some of them are on government uh, project government marketable land plots and we've thus far transacted on 6 of them so 6 out of 29 or actually yeah 6 out of 31 and the seventh is just about to uh, close early next year. why is it important to get this right you know the first time like you said what does that mean and to you what kind of challenges does it entail it's important demand because investment uh, has a lo- is long cycle big investment is very long cycle and if we want to catch the right wave we have to catch it at the right time so if we miss a particular investor or an investment opportunity because we are not ready for it or we don't have quite the right recipe for it then it's going to be a long while before that comes back and there's a reputational element also we have to be seen to be globally competitive globally attractive globally transparent there's a there's a lot of elements or ingredients that have to go into being an investment destination of quality dispute resolution mechanism speed of government action and court visas issue and um, families and uh, uh, all these various things how how can you hire people how can you fire people what processes do they need to uh, th- th- that recipe is required and you need to do it it's better to spend a few months getting that right first and not have to tinker with it as things go now there will be things we would re- revisit of course so can you you know what are some of the concessions that you plan to offer you know, to your investors in i think there is a distinction that needs to be drawn between uh, strategically important businesses who will get right. various tax holidays and concessions and then there are other investors both foreign and local So, so could you kind of disaggregate who these investors are and how they qualify to be in the city special economic uh, zone thank you yeah you're right um these 
exemptions from certain acts and incentives under certain acts uh, are defined to be given to businesses of strategic importance. Let's call them BSIs. So what's a BSI? Now that, that I think also is a moving target. For the moment, the Commission has identified as BSIs every single plot on the map, on the master plan. In other words, all of the immediate physical development projects have been identified as businesses of strategic importance, all 74, so whether they are project marketable land or government marketable land, which means that we can offer tailored incentives to these projects. And depending on the project, the incentive may either be the full, full range of incentives. Uh, in some cases, it may not need to be because not all of them are relevant. So that, that's, that's what it is in terms of physical infrastructure. Now, we also have businesses of strategic importance that are in the services sector. So that's banking, financial services, insurance, legal services. There are also those items that are essential for the pro success of the project. Those items that are essential for the project to actually take off and fly are being classified right now as businesses of strategic importance. What about businesses that fall outside this uh, definition? Well, it depends on what stage of the game we are talking about. If you are talking about, say, a foreign law firm that's coming into Sri Lanka to set up law, uh, legal services, or to run the arbitration center, for example, we have an international arbitration center that's part of the port city, then that will, by definition, have to be located outside because there is no physical infrastructure on site. So the law permits that to happen for a period of five years, and those would be a business of strategic importance, something that's coming in from outside. If you are also talking about things that are export-oriented services, uh, be, them, be them either already existing in Sri Lanka or to be relocated to Sri Lanka, those are also businesses of strategic importance. They will all sit outside the port city physically at the moment. Uh, in the port city, th there is another business of strategic importance going on. Uh, it's the downtown duty-free. It's a short-term project, as in it's a five-year project span in its temporary housing, which is a hundred thousand square feet. But it's a it's a unique uh, project, which brings downtown high-end luxury brands to the regional shopper, not just Sri Lankans. And the government is working to enhance allowances for um, returning Sri Lankans in incentivize foreign currency in with duty-free allowances. Things like that to increase the economic activity of this duty-free uh, facility. So that that's also a business of strategic importance. Anything, in fact, that generates revenue, that actually attracts investment at this time, uh, generates um, knowledge transfer, those are businesses of strategic importance. Eventually, that might change. Have, have you already... Has the criteria been laid down for what the strategic business uh, would need to have to qualify? Yeah, so certain certain businesses now, the, the physical infrastructure has every single plot has been identified as business of strategic importance. Then there are these other sectors, banking and services finance, knowledge export, all those are also business of strategic importance. The other one which can happen virtually first and physically later is, uh, is an exchange, asset exchanges, stock exchanges, commodity exchanges, digital asset exchanges. Those things are also strategic because they generate uh, uh, turnover and turnover generates transactional profits for uh, settlement banks and corresponding banks and so on and so forth. So these are all ac economic activity generators. They have been defined. But we have not specified what uh, incentives or exemptions apply. That it isn't a blanket definition. We typically would like to do the best we can for an investor in terms of commercializing their project. But we'd like to have that conversation with them first. So we, we don't know what the tax holidays or the exemptions would look look like right now. Not necessarily, but I can just give you an example. There are some plots that are very very commercial. Uh, the CIFC plot is commercial and it has a predefined tax holiday from the SDPA days of 15 years. On the other hand, 
a convention center is un unless you're a professional operator of convention centers and you have a big order book it's not a very not an immediately commercial pro project so that might qualify for the full 40 year exemption and then there's in between there are the mixed developments there's the house um, the, the residential developments and the hospitals and schools that it it is a little bit premature to give a blanket specification of these and i have to make one thing also fairly clear the commission can only recommend these things the president of sri lanka must approve them and then so must the cabinet of ministers so there's a process by which these things can finally be taken to the market but that doesn't stop us from having the conversation with investors at this stage there are some concerns that the parliament is not included in this process is that a fair well let's put it like this the parliament passed the act uh, the act the so parliament had plenty of oversight in, in onto the act the act defines the role of parliament in it and parliament is involved because ultimately everything we do ends up as a note to parliament or information to parliament and therefore public and therefore subject to debate and scrutiny and we are obviously accountable to parliament through the president who is accountable to parliament through the constitution so there's a there's a link who, who does the commission report to when i say report to what is also being done to ensure that you know there's some kind of stability not just in the commission but the entire project you know what happens if the government changes uh, for various reasons we've seen the the matle airport and the hamban to the hamban to the port so what can be done to ensure that you know, the commission is stable and the project has legs to run with you know, the government change the commission at the moment there are seven members that's the maximum permitted by law are all appointed by the president and uh, they serve for 3 years they are accountable to the president in other words everything the commission does in terms of incentivizing or providing exemptions and so on and so forth needs to be approved by his excellency so from that standpoint we report to him and constitutionally he also has other reporting lines to 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 the people ultimately in terms of stability well uh, the the act itself provides a fair amount of protection to the job security of the commissioners if i may call it that uh, also carries with it a certain amount of indemnity or immunity for acts performed in good faith so that there is no huge exposure from that standpoint provided one is seen to be acting in good faith um, so it, the conditions under which commissioners can be removed are limited they are there but they're limited and they are not influenceable by uh, by politics you know, one one can understand the need to have separate rules for especially for an international financial center if you want to attract uh, serious investments to the country get things going uh, then how do you deal with you know some of the questions that are being raised i think which is important to kind of you need to establish credibility in the entire project so so how do you reconcile the fact that you know this is a separate entity i mean there are several exemptions from various regulatory uh, various authorities uh, I saw a previous interview you did you said the commission has the authority to write up superseding legislature so what does it all mean okay as uh, let me you have to give me a minute or two to answer that question devan let me start by saying that in order to attract investment which is the primary objective we have to perform aggressive business process improvement people call it ease of doing business and currently some of the systems that exist in the country are either not working well or completely broken which means that people spend a lot of time to get simple things done 
this is very off-putting to investors. Now we need to streamline that and sometimes it needs to be done legislatively. You have to debug and deregulate and de-block these parts. But in doing so, you've got to be responsible about your um, actions. So we we've got to make it easier for people to do what needs to be done to set up a business, employ people and work with people, transfer money in and out. For example, that's a very good one. At the moment, it's very difficult to do that freely in Sri Lanka. So there are there are certain things that need this separate, the, the wall between. The long game, of course, is to establish new standards and then hopefully push them out into the rest of the administrative structure of the country. We need to be able to, it's a sandbox environment right now from a regulatory standpoint. We have a limited mandate to experiment with regulations. How have investors responded so far? There have been six lease agreements already signed. In other words, that land has been handed over to the investor to develop. To, to develop. The, the, the total of that is approximately 200 million US dollars in terms of transaction value. Uh, the investment envisaged on those plots totals a further five, 600 million US dollars. So in other words, these are commitments. These are leases given to partners, parties who have committed to invest the balance. Uh, not all of that money will come in over the next year, but over the next three years, we expect it all to come in. Uh, are they all offshore companies? Or what, 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 what's the, na the, the nature of these companies? Are there any local? The, ga the, 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 the Act stipulates that the entity, the legal entity that does business in or from the port city must be an offshore company. There are reasons for that. These companies that apply and get the leases granted, they are not necessarily offshore companies yet. But when they function and they joint venture to form a special purpose vehicle for the purpose of obtaining the concessions that they might or might not get, that will have to be an offshore company. Those will have to be offshore companies. So, so do you mean to say that these companies are local companies? Some of them Some are, yeah. You wouldn't be in a position to tell us which areas those investments are? Uh, I can. Uh, the four marina plots have already been uh, leased. So the marina as a property, International Marina, has already been leased. The marina hotel, which I think in most people's opinion is a, a, an essential twin to the marina, it adds critical mass to the investment, is also leased. The marina Condominium and residences are under discussion, final stages. The uh, Colombo International Financial Center Phase 1 has already been leased. That's a significant investment, it's a large project. Um, that's what's going on at the moment. But there, there are, there's a lot more interest uh, in the market. We just need to convert that into actual commitment over a period of discussion and dialogue with the investors. Any, any foreign investor interest? Uh, yes, there is. Um, there is a lot of foreign investor interest. In specific areas, there is a lot of interest in the school. There is a lot of interest in the hospital. And we are talking again to quality partners. Uh, nothing has come close to signing yet, but we expect that within the next six months, both of them should. Is there a ticket size for FDI at the Port City? Well, there are two aspects and one aspect has two parts. The two aspects are physical and virtual. Physical is the actual plot, physical development on the Port City. That has two parts, which is the land cost and the development cost. Uh, that though those two are very specific ticket sizes because this is a designed development it's pre-designed so there are notional costs for the building or the structures that are expected to be built on that 
The land has a transactional value, of course, which is also defined. The minimum, I would say, it depends on what the purpose is that you want it for and how much you want it. Could be as little as $5 million, $10 million to as much as uh, $100 million in terms of land or more. Yeah. And then there's the whole development cost. For example, the school, uh, we believe uh, a 40 million US dollar budget is required for the construction of the school. A hundred million dollar budget is required for the construction of the hospital. And a, maybe a hundred and fifty million dollar budget is required for the construction of a large scale convention center. So there are, there are numbers such as that. But the entry point is, is the smallest plot with the smallest development. What's the land price like? Is it, does it differ from section to section? It or? does differ from section to section because there are restrictions, there are building restrictions that apply. So some of the land that has been transacted recently has transacted at less than your average per purchase price uh, in Colombo. But it carries more restrictions than your average perch purchased in Colombo. When you say restrictions, what kind of restrictions? Primarily coverage, how much of that area can you build on, how much must you leave open, and gross flow area or plot ratio, you know, there's how many square feet or square meters can you build on that plot, which defines the height. And these are defined by the, the commission? The commission has approved them. The, they, the commission inherited these development control regulations. They were drafted by an uh, international team of uh, designers from the UK and Singapore, uh, supported by India, and we have adopted them. It's a planned city. Can a local company, without dollars, can, can they buy a parcel of land or lease a parcel yes, of land for development? They can pay for land in rupees. That's permitted by law. Okay. So you, even if, you know, these uh, apartment buildings or office spaces open up when I mean, they do so locals can take out rent or can lease out space is it um, yes now that there is a, a little debate going on there because um, the act actually is is not explicit in this the act envisages foreign investment in the infrastructure foreign currency transactions on a business level. In other words, uh, the act envisages infrastructure to be developed using dollars or dollar equivalent uh, foreign currency and people who are working in the port city get paid in dollars, they can pay in dollars and so on and so forth. So there's a dual currency system uh, envisaged. Actual implementation of it uh, we are working on because now you asked a question, can a local company buy land? Yes, it can. But can a local company buy land and develop it? Well, it then needs a foreign partner because the development money needs to come in from outside. And then after it's developed, can a Sri Lankan company or individual buy a flat or property in it? At the moment, that transaction is restricted to US dollars. So what about companies who get the exemptions and how do they interact with the rest of the country uh, when it comes to suppliers or service providers? Are there any rules that govern those relationships and, and do their exemptions then cover their suppliers and service providers as well? Yes to the first, no to the second. In other words, Port city incorporated companies or authorized persons as defined by the law can do business with service providers outside the port city. Uh, the st structurally how that happens is say they want legal services, accounting services or, or whatever, financial services, banking services, whatever. They uh, need to write to the commission and seek approval from the commission but that's a technicality and that permits them to do business with any other part in Sri Lanka. But that party does not avail of any of the benefits accorded to the original authorized person. They, they, they are living in a jurisdiction which is standard normal laws of Sri Lanka.
And they can employ people outside the country. And yes, they can employ yeah. inside and outside. And, uh, can people make use of you know the the, the public spaces? Uh, can they buy stuff from a mall or yes. eat at a restaurant? Yes. So the retail and experience will be no different to that in uh, Shangri-La, for example, right next door. A public will be permitted, will be encouraged to visit the public areas. There is no border control. There will be some behavioral rules because there are safety aspects. You know, this is a beach after all and people have to behave responsibly. So there'll be a little bit more stringent policing of, of activity, but uh, it's not a restricted area. At the moment it is because it's still being constructed. I'm talking about when it gets developed. And there's also Maybe some kind of levy, right? If they buy stuff from that No area. more than there is in the mall in Shangri-La. Yeah. Now there is a, the duty-free mall, the duty-free podium is different. That has the ability to sell duty-free stuff to those with the duty-free allowance, registered purchasers. What will the commission put in place to ensure that uh, you know, the rest of the country benefits from having an international financial center or a global economic hub to, to, to make sure that some of these gains are really manifest themselves in the hinterland. Yeah. Are those something that, that's occupying your mind right now? Well, looking at the Act, it defines uh, six or seven objectives of the Commission and those center around attracting foreign direct investment, business process improvement, employment creation, and so on and so forth. Fiscally, the Commission interacts directly with the Consolidated Fund. So the Commission revenue, while it comes into the Commission Fund, part of it will be sent directly on through central government. From that point of view, we will fulfill financial obligations we are expected to by providing revenue to the government. What the government does with it is up to the government at the time. We as a commission are independent when we want to remain financially independent and we will have some funds that sit in a commission fund, money that sits in the commission fund. But in terms of the commission directly interacting with the rest of the hinterland, the, uh, can you tell us about the, 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 the the arbitration process yeah. and then you know, the, the, the special courts at the zone. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're designed to, to, to be fast, right? Yeah. There are people who find, uh, who take excep exception to that. Uh, would you like to tell us how that is structured? Yeah. I'll start with the arbitration center, Devan. There's an international arbitration center envisaged in the act. And physically also we have such a, an instrument. It is the Colombo Arbitration Center, which actually occupies uh, a part of the World Trade Center. Yes, there's a property already built for these purposes, uh, not extensively used at the moment, but it's available and fully fitted out. So what the commission has done is the commission has entered into a joint venture or a, an MOU with the Ministry of Justice. Um, Ms. Ali Sabri uh, has been driving that together with the Commission uh, in order to jointly solicit for and receive expressions of interest from international law firms to operate the arbitration center. So what eventually we are hoping to have is uh, a foreign law firm, British, American, Indian, Singaporean, running an international arbitration center physically starting where it is now and eventually moving when physical infrastructure develops in the port city. And it will run it independently of both the Ministry of Justice and the Commission. They will run it. They will be free to, to use their choice, uh, their, their client's choice of arbitrators, uh, applicable law, all of that stuff. Now the arbitration center is designed to address disputes that arise within the area of authority. Uh, so jurisdiction-wise, it's, it's covered between the investors and the commission and potentially between investors themselves. But we also want to make it attractive to bring in arbitration from regional arbitration centers. Hence the idea to make it 
It's not Sri Lanka flavored, it's international. That's the Justice Ministry's uh, vision for it as well. Now, you are, had another question, which was the, the no, court of law. The court. There is no physical court there at the moment, but there is um, notionally, again, with the Ministry of Justice, uh, a process, uh, the judicial process earmarked in a, for physical execution in Halstorf, somewhere else, which is a, an expedited session. So, you know, you provide closure to investors quickly. It, that hasn't been operationalized yet, but that's the plan. I think we'll wrap it up. Salia, if you could just tell us, you know, what, what is your expectation for the market? In terms of FDI, is there, I know you don't want to, difficult thing to do playing with expectations but do you have a number in your mind that you hope to achieve in terms of FDI next year? I hope. What does the outcome I would like to be able to give you a number Devan. There are so many macro factors that impinge on our ability to predict that. But let me tell you this. We would like to have the primary government plots on the market next year which is the international school, international hospital and the convention center at least signed up for development partner identified and signed up so that would then bring in in some form a transactional value relating to the land and the cost of development how much of it will be realized next year is uh, your guess is as good as mine but uh, if you just take the basic value of that little parcel that i just described there's, uh, there's at least five or six hundred million dollars there. Then there are the virtual businesses that are not capital intensive but generate a lot of revenue, say a digital asset exchange or a stock exchange, an offshore capital, say a US dollar dominated board for, for, for regional uh, capital market access or regional retail uh, market access. Investors accessing the capital markets in foreign exchange. There are things like that which, which there's a distinction between FDI and revenue. Uh, the duty free is low FDI, very high revenue, high turnover, let's say, just like an exchange. Banking and financial services, high turnover, low FDI. But then you have the physical infrastructure, which is high FDI and low turnover. So it's a, it's a mix, the part is a mixed bag. And I wouldn't want to say to you a billion, a billion and a half, or two billion, it, it would be meaningless in this, at this time. At least the, the overall project, I think the, the physical plots available is estimated at 15 billion, right? That's right, right. yeah. The, the value of the development once it's in place. And if you add the virtual investments, what, what kind of number are you looking at? Over the next 25 years, what kind of number are you looking at? So there's a, that's a bit of an open-ended question. The cost of development, which includes the land and the infrastructure that is planned, is 15 billion. But that's not a reflection of economic activity. That that is just pure spend. Then the economic activity, which is contributing in addition to that to GDP, that could be tens and tens of billion. Thank you for joining us. I hope it was a enjoyable and insightful discussion.